Hello, hello, hello. You are watching Know Your Rights Thursday with me, Christina Laster, and National Parents Union. I hope that you're all well. I, I hope that you're all thriving. Um, I apologize for the delay. Apparently, I had some technical difficulties, but just glad to be here on this Thursday to share information and vital resources with all of you. Why do we do this Know Your Rights, right? As you can see, scrolling across the bottom, it says Know Your Rights. You're in the right place at the right time, right? Um, the reason why we do this is because in order for you to be able to advocate with the knowledge and hit your target every time, right? You need to understand those policies, practices, structures, all of the above that are really governing your child's education, right? In order for you to be able to make the best informed decision possible, you need to be able to understand. And so that's why we do this. Hopefully it's helpful. As you can see, you're able to leave comments or questions feedback in the chat, more than uh, welcome those things. And so I'm going to get ready to start this presentation. If you're watching, go ahead and share this information out. It can be very vital to someone that needs it. It might be on-time information. And when this uh, show is finished broadcasting live, you will be able to also go back and watch the video. So let's get started. So today, I am going to be going over uh, zero tolerance policies and practices, right? Every um, single time while I'm like dealing with discrimination issues or complaints, this question around uh, policies and practices and zero tolerance behavior modification, interventions and supports always seems to come up. It's a reoccurring theme. So I wanted to take this opportunity to really guide and walk you through what does it mean, right? Understanding how they may impact your child's education and future. So if you um, want to know what zero tolerance refers to, here it is right here. Zero tolerance refers to school discipline, discipline policies and practices that mandate predetermined consequences, typically severe, punitive, and exclusionary, right? So what does exclusionary mean? Well, they usually exclude a child from the environment where they're getting their education, like school suspension, expulsion. That's what uh, we're referring to when we say exclusionary, okay? Um, in response to specific types of student misbehavior, Okay, we're going to be going diving into this, y'all. So um, make sure that you, you know, are able to uh, either take notes or you can come back and view this for the information because you will definitely need this information when advocating. Regardless of the context or rationale for their behavior, right? So let's talk about that. Over here, you can see zero tolerance practices, zero tolerance has not been shown to improve school climate or school safety. I'm gonna be bringing that information up and sharing it with you in the chat. All of the links for everything that I share, for all the data that I present, um, so that you'll have it in your toolkit when you're ready to advocate um, for better policies and practices, right? It's application and sus suspension and expulsion has not proven an effective means of improving student behavior, okay? Um, this is all based on data. We'll be going over that. It has not resolved and indeed may have exasperated minority overrepresentation in school punishments. What does that mean? We're gonna be going over that. Streamline students of color into the juvenile justice system and are not conducive to positive lifelong outcomes, right? So zero tolerance practices has been proven to streamline students of color into the juvenile justice system and are not conducive to positive lifelong outcomes. Another uh, portion of the population that is overrepresented in school punishments is students with disabilities, right? And there's some overlap there. So, you know, really looking at ways to impact uh, policy and practice changes is why um, 
you know, it is important to know your rights, important to have this data, and important to have the resources in your toolkit to be able to advocate for better. Let's go to the next one. All right. So looking at zero tolerance policies and practices, there was an American Psychological Association Zero Tolerance Task Force. Some of you may have uh, known that. Most of us may not, right? Are zero tolerance policies effective in schools? An evidentiary review and recommendations, right? So I, I typically uh, tend to um, trust people that are experts in their field um, versus maybe those that may not have any knowledge, may have some experience um, and understanding slightly, but, you know, are they really dealing with um, brain specific um, and researched information, right? This report, and we're going to go through it, highlights research identifying that zero tolerance practices may negatively affect the relationships between education and juvenile justice, as well as hinder adolescent development. Whoa, wait a minute. So it's not just about the school to prison pipeline. We're looking at development, right? How these types of policies and practices may hinder adolescent development, right? All of us want our children to learn and thrive. We want them to be reaching their fullest potential into adulthood, right? And don't want that stagnated or hindered in any type of way or fashion. So we're gonna be looking at the ways that it may hinder adolescent development, right? Um, the report concludes that data raises questions about the effectiveness of zero tolerance practices. Practices, sorry, policies. That ah, got my grandma eyes on y'all. So here we're going to look at evidence right because i can have my feelings all day long and you know what nah, tomorrow they might be different or you know really who who wants to hear about my feelings right and so what we're going to be looking at is the actual evidence um to see what does the evidence say about zero tolerance practices and policies okay go to the next and I'm going to be maneuvering through um, slides. So we'll just be patient because I'll be bringing up uh, a different page after this one. So it says exhibit A, right? And, and as you can see, I, I have on the right side, you know, a cartoon uh, character um, depicting a teacher, no talking, no laughing, no smiling. In fact, no, nothing that it induces any kind of pleasure. And that's how children can feel sometimes, right? Like they are young and vibrant and moving and shaking and doing all kind of other stuff that kids just do. And then now have to be like stiff and uh, statue-like. I mean, it's, it's really difficult for that to happen in an environment and to also learn. So, you know, I asked the question, is it humane, ethical? reasonable right just and fair okay so let's we're going to be turning over to exhibit a evidence of if zero tolerance practices actually are effective and work or not and we're going to be looking at the school discipline support initiative okay so here's a quote that i took out of that before i go to that that actual screen although originally intended as a response to serious offenses like drug sales or engage, engaging in gang-related fights on school grounds, right? I mean, there's no parent that I know that's going to, you know, say, look, we want drug sales at school and we want students to be fighting at school, right? Um, you know, I don't think that you're going to find many parents if we were to do a poll of just the parents that are watching this, like, how many of you would like drugs to be sold at your kid's school? No one, right? How many of you want any gang-related fights? Nobody. But does that actually equate to the punishment practices um, that are taking place? And so let's keep reading. To ensure safe and healthy schools in recent years, zero tolerance practices, policies have been applied broadly to include minor offenses, talking back to school personnel, that's 
is that age appropriate, right? We, we're going to look at that. Bringing over-the-counter or prescription drugs on school grounds without the doctor's note, okay? Um, and coming to school out of uniform. I've even seen um, zero tolerance policies um, related to hair. Just saying, right? Um, and so then you see like the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, zero tolerance, school zero tolerance practices typically do not specify rehabilitative or supportive services to help students, right? It, it, it almost seems like um, having that in the same sentence is a challenge for me. I, I just got to say that, right? Like it's rehabilitative and supportive for students, not having them for children. We're talking about children. We're talking about developing youth, right? So we're going to dig into this. Stay tuned because we're going to go through all of this stuff, right? Um, and to help students change their behavior. So what is the goal of it then? If it's not to um, help students change their behavior, we need to look at what is the goal of it. It is it something that should still be existing, okay? Um, research has demonstrated that zero tolerance policies can lead to harmful effects of individuals, lead to higher rates of exclusionary disciplinary action, and are associated with improved with and are not associated with improved school safety. So they also quote the American um, Psychological Association. I believe that is what it is. So I'm going to stop sharing and look in the comment field. You guys go ahead and keep dropping your comments. No problem. I'm going to be sharing, going back and forth. And so let's see here. We have Tabby. Our children are governed with a zero tolerance policy. But when said child is injured or killed, it's 100% tolerated. That's hypocrisy, Tabby. We're going to talk about the hypocrisy behind some of these practices. Let's see. Maria, thank you for chiming in. Most school disciplinary practices in my area are not just, they are often extreme and harm Black children. I got the data for that. Stay tuned. All right. And Jerisha, preschool to prison pipeline. We have to protect our children. Facts don't care about your feelings. Exactly. And so I tend to come from just a research-driven uh, place when presenting this information. And I'm sure there's probably a whole bunch of counter uh, narratives and claims that can be made, but the evidence is more than abundant. Um, and so let's go to that now. Going to give me a second while I switch pages here. Let's see, this one should be, all right. Sorry, y'all, still, you know. All right, so I'm gonna put this link in the chat. If you would like to look at it as I am presenting it, then by all means, go ahead and do that. Okay, here you have it. So can you guys see that? I'm going to try to make it larger, okay? Um, maybe not that large, but all right. So I'm going to put this link in the chat. If you're just tuning in, we're talking about zero tolerance policies and practices. You can definitely uh, share this information. Make sure that you keep uh, notes and utilize these resources that are packed with information for you. OK, that's how we come at advocacy um, from a place that's beyond feelings, like uh, one of the parent viewers said, but with facts. Right. So let's look at this. Right. We're talking about what is the most effective way to deal with school uh, behaviors and to help students to change their behaviors. Right. And what are the policies behind um, certain practices that we know um, are exclusive, harsh, um, punitive and really don't change the behavior okay so right here as you can see i um gave the information about the evidentiary review that's quoted but also if you go down like say for instance you want to um look at this which i definitely advise you to um and then see all of the um 
reports and analysis that are done, right? Um, some of these are state specific, some are not. Um, here is just tons of information. As you can see, it's just a lot. So this is a good resource to have so that you can, um, you know, really tap into other resources. Let's go to the actual evidentiary review. All right. If there, if you guys aren't able to see this, it's taken some time to load. I'm not really sure what the situation is going on here with um, with uh, the internet. I won't name any companies because <laughs> it's not going to be helpful. All right. Here you go. So as we can see, okay, here is an evidentiary review and recommendations. Well, isn't that great, right? Sometimes people say, well, you know, why are you complaining if you didn't bring any recommendations or any types of solutions or any types of things that we could do to resolve the problem? Well, here you go. You have a review and you have solutions, okay? So if you look through this document, which we're not going to, we're not going to go through the, um, the entire document today, right? We're not going to go. Here is from also a credible source the American Psychological Association Zero Tolerance Task Force that I quoted, okay? And you can see here some of the information that I said, right? More over, zero tolerance policies may negatively affect the relationship of education with juvenile justice and appear to conflict to some degree with current best knowledge concerning adolescent development. Right. We're talking about ages and stages of development and growth. What is age appropriate? You can you can say it that way. Right. What is age appropriate? Um, let's go down and see what else is in this. Definitely a good resource to look through um, and have your conversation um, filled with data. Findings of the task force. Right. You see the findings of the task force have zero tolerance policies made school safer and more effective in handling disciplinary issues. Let's look at that, okay? They say here, we examine the data concerning the following five key assumptions of zero tolerance policies and general data tended to contradict the presumptions made in applying a zero tolerance approach. So obviously the answer is right there. Have they made schools safer and more effective in handling disciplinary issues. No, the evidence contradicts that, okay? They're not, um, you know, um, maintaining discipline and order, okay? So as you can see, school violence um, at a critical, uh, at a crisis level and increasing, thus necessitating forceful nonsense strategies for uh, violence prevention, go through this and look at it, familiarize yourself with this data so that when you're talking um, about maybe something that happened to your child, right? We tend to get emotional. We tend to become very upset when things happen to our children. That's right. That's, that's a natural human response, right? Um, but what you have to learn how to practice to do, right, um, is yes, you can become very emotional, but how do you have that conversation filled with emotion and data, right? That's what is going to apply at the end of the day. I, I sit in a meeting and I discuss how sad I feel about what happened to my child. Yeah, well, someone in that meeting may have compassion, but what is going to produce the outcome and the impact of change, especially policy, practices, it's going to be something that is data-driven and not based off of the fact that I feel sad about what you're doing and I need you to stop, right? And so typically um, when I see that there is a situation, I point parents to the data. That's what I'm doing here. And even in their letters and responses um, to school staff or administrators, um, definitely to be able to quote or to highlight or to share some of this data. It's an assumption that everybody knows. Some people may, and they just, you know, for whatever reason, um, we're not gonna discuss that today, but we wanna make sure, right? We wanna make sure that in our conversations, we're presenting facts and data, okay? Here's number two. Um, 
what has been the impact on, of zero tolerance practices on students of color and students with disability. Like I said earlier, um, there is a disproportionate impact or amount of students that are impacted um, by zero tolerance practices, okay? So let's look at what they have to say. The American, again, let's go back. American Psychological Association Zero Tolerance Task Force who studied this information and collated this data for us. Part of the appeal of zero tolerance policies has been the expectation that by removing subjective influences or contextual factors from disciplinary decisions, such policies would be fair to students traditionally overrepresented in school disciplinary co consequences. The evidence, however, does not support an assumption. Rather, the disproportionate discipline of students of color continues to be of a, a concern. Overrepresentation and suspension and expulsion has been found consistently for African American students, less consistently for Latino students. That may have changed. I'm going to go to some uh, recent other information that is underway currently as we speak. Um, and the evidence shows that shows that such disproportionality is not due entirely to economic disadvantage. What does that mean, right? When we're looking at data and we're disaggregating data, often you'll see categories. You see categories based on race, ethnicity. Hey, I didn't create these categories, whether y'all like them or not, they exist. Okay. And so a lot of people want to argue about, well, you know, all students. Well, yeah, but that's not the way the categories are, are, are created. And so talk to the con to your congressman about that. Tell them like just to put all. Okay. But until then, we're going to disaggregate the data. All right. So here you have um, the evidence shows that such disproportionality is not due to it entirely to economic disadvantage. Some students um, that qualify for, you know, as low income um, socioeconomic status. Um, and then what they're saying is that the students don't all fall into that category, right? Um, so we know that that's not a factor. The economic disadvantage is not a factor, right? Um, nor are there any data supporting the assumption that African-American students exhibit higher rates of disruption or violence that would warrant higher rates of discipline. Rather, African-American students may be disciplined more severely for less serious or more subjective reasons, okay? So we had the parent who put in this information right here, okay? And this data is supporting exactly what you're experiencing or feeling about that, right? So you definitely want to uh, be able to uh, point to the data, even with your experiences and your, and your feelings or your thoughts about something and say, look, here is the information. Here is the proof. This is what I would like to discuss. Okay. All right. And so I'm not going to go through this entire thing. I want you to take your um, time when you can to just go through it so you can have that information. It goes on to talk about, um, although there are fewer, dat fewer data available, students with disabilities, especially those with emotional and behavioral disorders, appear to be suspended and expelled at rates disproportionate and i'm sure it says to their um to their counterparts so i'm going to stop sharing that and i want you just to really think about that right like is it humane okay we're going to keep asking this question i have several exhibits for you looking at that evidence and supporter against um is it humane is it ethical is it reasonable is it just, right, and fair, okay? So those are questions that you can um, write down, jot down that question, and when you're, you know, having this discussion, um, and maybe you have some people that are saying, but no, you know, we need to keep these zero tolerance practices for this reason. Start out with that question, right? I, I wanna know if, if you believe that it's just, 
humane, ethical, reasonable, and fair, okay? Um, and then present the data. Let me show you why it's not, right? Let me show you why it's not, all right? So we are um, gonna go to the next screen. If you have any um, questions while you're watching this about anything that I'm presenting, please feel free to drop that in the chat and I will uh, do my very best to answer everyone's questions. If not, I'll have to get back to you um, after the show, but I don't want to miss your question. All right, let's go to another exhibit. So we just finished looking at, so I'm, I'm way ahead of my slide. We just finished looking at actually exhibit B. Um, both of those um, items are placed in the comment field for you to be able to go and look at. So when you look, go to the um, supportive school discipline site, you're going to find that our zero tolerance policy is effective in schools. Okay. So I want to stop right here for a second to talk about um, humane, ethical, and reasonable, right? So if we know that um, young brains are still developing, right? Um, I'm not a brain scientist, but the data is out there from brain scientists, okay? However, what I do know is from my experience of children is that they're still learning and growing and their mind is, you know, is stretching and, 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 and trying to understand and also internalize everything within their environments, okay? So we see right here, Brain functionality, it tells you the different parts of the brain. These are all uh, tied to certain ages and stages of development as well, right? So you can definitely look that up and utilize that with your advocacy. Frontal lobe, problem solving. Do we actually believe that um, preschoolers, kindergartners, first graders, third graders, second graders, fifth graders, whatever, elementary school students, are completely able to problem solve, right? They're still developing that. We're, we're, we're supposed to be fostering and helping them to develop that, okay? What about um, basic life functions, right? I know there are um, kindergartners that still might wet the bed, right? Basic life functions, right? Memories. Uh, studies show that long-term memory oftentimes doesn't kick in until two. Right. So why are are there zero tolerance practices against preschoolers, which I am going to show you in the data after we leave this slide. Right. That the civil rights office for civil rights has put together. Right. Why and how could a person without sufficient long term memory. Even. Benefit if that's the way to even say it, because I don't find it to be beneficiary, been a, um, it, from any kind of zero tolerance practice, right? So I'm going to kick a three-year-old out of school and hopefully they'll get it right. I, I, I don't get that. And I'm sure of you may feel the same. Maybe some of you do not. Um, I understand that, you know, little children often have biting issues, right? Biting or, you know, walking up to people and, and, and touching, you know, right? And so looking at ways to modify that behavior would be better than saying, I'm going to exclude you at three years old or two years old from your learning environment um, and trying to help them to get it right. Okay. Now, would I want my child bitten? Of course not. Of course not. But then is it a reasonable expectation that these things are not going to happen if I have my child in a, in a nursery or daycare or preschool? Well, yeah, you know, other children are there and things are going to happen. To what extent the punishment are taking place is what we look at, right? We need to be reasonable, right? What is our expectation? What is others' expectations of our children, right? So looking at brain functionality is an important component of understanding um, child development and understanding what is reasonable, what is humane for them, what is ethical, right, just, and fair, 
Okay. So here we have, um, moreover, zero tolerance uh, policies may negatively affect the relationship of education with juvenile justice and appear to conflict to some degree with current best knowledge concerning adolescent development. To address the needs of schools for discipline that can maintain school safety while maximizing student opportunity to learn. And I put that information in the chat. You definitely go check it out. Let's go on to the next one. All right. Exhibit C. Now, this is a, a, a major complaint that I get from a lot of parents. Like, my child is not just being targeted for uh, behavior problems, labeled, stigmatized, et cetera, and the list goes on, unbelievably so, even with uh, preschoolers and kindergartners. But I believe that it's discriminatory, okay? I believe that it's discriminatory because I see other children or I know of other children that are doing the same things are worse and nothing happens. That's the number one complaint that I hear from parents, right? And so let's look at the way that it's viewed in the data, okay? Black students who accounted for 15.1% of total student enrollment were expelled at rates that were more than twice their share of total enrollment, 38.8% of expulsions with educational services and 33.3% of expulsions without educational services, okay? How are they going to access their education? Okay, that's what those educational services are talking about. American Indian or Alaska Native students were expelled at rates 1.1 and 1.8 percent that were higher than their share of total student enrollment 1.0. Like, how are you getting expelled at rates more than double the share of your total population? Right? I, I mean, seriously. Seriously. So let's go directly to that page. Um, and it's right here. All right. You see it matches, right? So this information is provided to you by the Department of Education. And I'm going to highlight it and drop it in the chat so that you will be able to access this data because I am not able to go through all of it, but I do want you to see um, some parts of it. And hopefully that will um, trigger a response for you to go back and research more. Okay. All right. So here we have an overview, an overview of the exclusionary discipline practices in public schools for this 2017-18 school year. Now you guys are probably wondering, well, where's the recent, most recent data? Well, you know, the pandemic happened in two years and, you know, and so we have to use the most recent data and their update was on uh, June, 2021, civil rights data collection. So uh, it's going to indicate some things, and I'm sure that there's more um, studies underway currently, and I will point you to where why I say that in a minute. All right. So let's look at this, okay? Now, if this is going to tell you a little bit about the data collection, right? The data collection. Definitely want to know how people are collecting their data, okay? Um, and so it tells you exactly. This is the Civil Rights Data Collection, CRDC covers nearly every public school, pre-K through 12th grade in the 50 states, DC and Puerto Rico, okay? This includes charter schools, alternative schools, juvenile justice facilities, and special education facilities. The CRDC collects school district data also, okay? So let's look at what they have to uh, show here. Let me close this tools bar so that you guys can see. Let me see. All right. So here you have a snapshot of student enrollment. I'm just going to walk you through here. We're going to stop at maybe one or two parts, right? Um, so you can understand. And like I said, the, the data is disaggregated, whether people like to have categories or, um, you know, subgroups or whatever, that's for you to take to your local government or Congress and say, hey, you know, like we just wanted to stay all and, you know, whatever, right? But we're not having that discussion today because this is what the data indicates. Um, and it's based off of the disaggregation according to um, race, ethnic, ethnicity, and other um, student populations, such as 
English learners and disabled students, okay? So as you can see in this uh, pie right here, there are the uh, percentages and here are the uh, out of 50 million students that attend it, right? And here's a report in the changes overall. Okay, so that's a part that has um, all indicated. All right, and then we're going to go down to this. Of course, there's more lovely pie graphs. And so someone was mentioning about preschool, okay? What's happening with the babies? What's happening with the babies? Because when I see a preschooler and I have a four grandchildren and four children, two are adults, two of my children are adults, two are still in school, school aged. When I see little kids, they're babies. I'm thinking like preschool, that's a baby to me. You know, I've lived long enough to be able to say, you know, maybe when I was in uh, elementary school, preschoolers didn't seem like babies to me. But now as an adult, I, I recognize that these are babies. Okay, so let's what's happening with the babies. So as you can see right here, preschool students received one or more 2,822 preschool students, okay? Received one or more out of school suspensions. That, that's a lot, just saying, what, what are they doing, right? Um, and how is that helping them to learn? Okay, so here it is broken down a little bit more. Black preschool students accounted for 18.2% of the total preschool enrollment, but received 43.3% of one or more out of school suspensions. Okay. Multiracial preschool students accounted for 4.1% of total preschool enrollment, but received 6.5% of one or more out of school suspensions. Okay, American Indian or Alaska Native preschool. Okay, I'm gonna keep on repeating now. We're talking about what's happening with the babies, right? Students accounted for 1.1 of total preschool enrollment, but received 1.7 of one or more out of school suspensions. Why are children preschoolers, right? Think about that age group receiving out of school suspensions. Okay. The deficit definitely could not possibly be in them. Adults are going to have to challenge the way that they are processing things. You know, like I see kids being learned this technique or this uh, behavior type of um, modification or behavior awareness, self-awareness type of tactic called stop and think. Maybe some of you have um, seen that before, and it just uses a, you know, red light, green light, yellow light. Yeah, I'm going to need some grown folks to stop and think. I'm talking about babies, okay? I'm talking about babies. All right, so we're going to go down. And here are the expulsions in K-12. to Again, this is um, in the chat. You can review it. Um, if you want to look at more of these sections and like really understand them, I'm just highlighting a few so that you can get the point of the data collection um, that is done by, again, the Department of Education, uh, Office for Civil Rights, Civil Rights Data Collection. A lot of people say, where can I find the data? Well, here is one space you can find the data, and I gave you another um, place you can find it as well, okay? And... So a lot of times, some of this information comes from parents who um, file Office for Civil Rights complaints with the U.S. Department of Education as well. And so, you know, a lot of a lot of the information um, that you think that is not relevant, the only way that they will understand what is happening um, to be able to provide any type of guidance or intervention is by you reporting this information. Okay. And so here you have it. Um, oh, we, we already did preschool. Sorry, you guys. Okay. So here you have it again. Disaggregated by um, race and ethnicity. Now let's look at these students with disabilities. Okay. Let's look at these students with disabilities. So in 2017 and 18, students with disabilities served under IDEA. Okay. Under IDEA, which is the uh, governing... I call it the 
fed constitution, right? The special education law of the land, okay? Um, though it may not be, you know, <laughs> we'll have to talk about that another day because I can get triggered talking about um, sped and idea and how it's being implemented and all those, that stuff. So let's just stick to this. Um, served under idea represented 13.2% of the total student enrollment and received 23 0.3% of all expulsions. Wait a minute. Did they say suspensions or expulsions? Okay. So you guys do understand that when a student is expelled, it is very difficult for that student to find another school placement, right? Very challenging. This is the number one um, complaint that I have from students that have been harshly punished from parents of students with disabilities that have been harshly punished and they have nowhere else to go, okay? Um, and so 23% of those students were, 23% um, of all expulsions were with educational services and 14.8%, that's a lot, y'all, were without education services. So what is the purpose? <laughs> of having all of these um, compulsory attendance laws and education rules and regulations and all of this other stuff that dictate what parents have to do between this age and that age, what I call minimum maxes for K to 12 education. And then to harshly punish, especially a student with disability, there's some ethical, moral, uh, humane, reasonable questions that I have uh, regarding whether those, um, all of them could not be about violence and weapons. We, we already went through that on another slide. But then to not provide them with the education services that they need, are, that's should not be the function of the punishment, right? Like, um, aren't you supposed to get consequences that change or alter your behavior, but then you're told that you are denied education services and can't um, enter back in this school. So how does that equate to changing or modifying behavior with a positive outcome? Okay, you need to be thinking about that. All right, so when you have a chance, definitely go look at this chart. Wanted to um, go to the next one. And we have a corresponding slide that's gonna be about this. So let's go here. All right, so that was exhibit C. We looked at the uh, civil rights data um, and I put that in the chat. You can take a look at that. All right, exhibit D. See, I believe in bringing evidence, right? I believe in bringing evidence and data that helps to form your um, argument and advocacy for better um, and for policy changes, practices and policy changes, right? Um, and looking at, you know, where are these things currently taking place? Um, what students they're affecting, just in case you're watching and you know, you might say, I don't have any school age children. Well, you, you might be, you're a community member somewhere, right? So looking at that, looking at um, what is taking place and then, you know, knowing what to do next, okay? So we have right here, Exhibit D. And let me go ahead and read this. In a Dear Colleague letter, the U.S. Department of Education and the Department of Justice issued guidance to schools in 2014 of January. The guidance urged schools to change their discipline policies and included tools for identifying, avoiding, and remedying discriminatory practices in school discipline, okay? So we have a parent right here that said, preschool to prison pipeline, we have to protect our children. Absolutely, okay, absolutely. The U.S. Department, oh, I'm sorry, I went too fast. Here we go. Recommendations included limiting the use of suspension and expulsion, implementing positive behavior interventions and support, and collecting disaggregated data. It's just what I've been talking about the whole time, right? 
you have you, the the only way to combat discriminatory practices is to look at the data disaggregated and see how are certain groups of students um, being treated in comparison to their counterparts, right? Other than that, it's just a feeling, okay? Um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, along with the U.S. Department of Education, issued a policy statement on expulsion and suspension policies in early childhood education settings or childhood settings, okay? Including pre-kindergarten. So now you like really have to give guidance on not expelling and suspending toddlers? There's a principle called um, in local parentis. I'd like to talk about that for a minute right here because we're talking about guidance for babies, okay, which I get it, it's necessary, right? But then I want also look at the way that we um, challenge ourselves in situations. What is humane? What is ethical? What is reasonable? What is right? What is just? What is fair? Now, if you have a, a group of toddlers and one of them is curious and wants to discover everything in the setting, wants to touch everything, wants to do whatever. Do they deserve punishment for the, the children that might just want to sit down and discover what's right in front of them? No. But what they do deserve is to be taught how to function in environments that are in, in how to learn and develop, right? If they're destroying stuff, right? You don't suspend or expel them. You teach them, okay? So we're talking about pre, we're talking about pre preschoolers, toddlers. What is happening with the babies? I definitely want to look at um, that statement and those practices and to make sure that um, these recommendations um, are happening in your state, in your local um, school area, right? To make sure that babies are not getting um, suspended and expelled. Pre-kindergartners definitely are still babies. I see when I go into the store and look for uh, toddler clothes, it goes up to like 16, right? I, I mean, unless they changed it. What does the T mean? So y'all can see, I, I get triggered about the babies, but, you know, we all should. So let me go to the next um, screen. All right. So we have right here, excuse me, again, the National Conference of State Legislators, right? So I'm going to put this in the chat. So you will have this available to look at as a reference. And any one of these um, resources that I'm sharing are, are um, collated in the way that they offer the information that you need to advocate for better practices and policies, okay? Don't assume that these policies have been eradicated or that these practices don't exist because that would not be a good assumption. They actually do. And, and, and here is where we're going to find that information, okay? And so... Um, right here, it talks about, you know, just some of the history that I already shared with you. Um, and then state action. Okay, let's look at the state. So nine states, Arkansas, California, Connecticut, Louisiana, Nevada, New Mexico, North Carolina, Rhode Island, and Oregon, and the District of Columbia have passed legislation to limit the grades in which out-of-school suspension and expulsion can be used and prohibit school districts from using exclusionary discipline in response to certain nonviolent, non-drug-related infractions. Legislators in an additional three states, Georgia, Minnesota, and Oklahoma, introduced comparable legislation limiting exclusionary discipline during their 2015 session, okay? And so here you have, you know, um, other states, what they're doing, and but you do see state action, who took action, 
right? And so maybe you're in a place that did it. Well, this advocacy is going to be relevant to you, okay? There are 23 counties that last time I checked, 23, that still administer cor corporal punishment, okay? You, you need to know if that's where you live because that means that your child can get spanked at school and you might be mad about that, right? Um, like I, as a parent, would like to be informed about everything that is happening to my child, okay? I do not believe that there are, um, in all circumstances, people that are going to lovingly correct my child. Therefore, it is my duty to correct my child in the way that is most loving and developmentally correct, okay? Not everyone is going to do that. I talked to you guys about the concept of in local parentis, which means basically um, in the care or to be as a parent with children that are in your care, right? Just breaking that down in the simplest form, right? Um, and really what it said, what it's saying is, I, I, I quote it as, treat my child the way you're going to treat yours, okay? I want you to, to treat my child the way you're going to treat yours, unless you're abusive, then you know what? You just need help. Okay. That's a whole nother situation where you need to seek some, some professional help if you're, if you're abusing children. Okay. So you can definitely look at this, um, national conference of state legislators. This is actually a really good site to, uh, finding out, um, where ESSER funding is going, right? So you can type that in and they'll tell you like who's applied for it, um, which ones, ESSER 1, ESSER 2, ESSER 3. And so this is a way to track that information. Use this link, okay? All right, let's go on. So out of all of that information and documents that I shared, um, this was the quote that compelled me the most. And it zero tolerance 15 years after the rise of zero tolerance practice practices right policy zero tolerance right there is still no credible evidence that zero tolerance suspensions and expulsions are an effective method for changing student behavior okay and you know i like to think about it in this sense as well like are is our expectation hypocritical um because you know I know adults that still don't have full self-control and self-discipline and then want to have a, a high expectation of self-control and self-discipline on a, on a child where they're still developing and learning those skills. That's hypocritical, right? If I um, expect for a child to do something that I'm not even able to do, and then punish them for not doing it while I go free from punishment. That is hypocrisy, right? And so I don't condone hypocrisy in any kind of uh, format. Um, let's look at this Dear Colleague letter, okay? So I made mention of it. And this is important, okay? So... The Dear Colleague letter that I made mention of from 2014 is still there. It's still there. You can go in and you can look at it, right? And it is um, about, you know, school discipline, uh, exclusionary harsh punishment practices, and um, discriminatory kind of student-based uh, discipline. But what's important, too, is to note this is under review, right? So this document and the underlying issues are under review by the U.S. Department of Education and the U.S. Department of Justice as of July 30, 2021, okay? Um, the 2018 Dear Colleague letter that rescinded this document is also under review. The Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights has published a request for information. I'm not sure if you were a part of that Um request for information or if anyone shared that that with you, but definitely worth checking in to see if that uh, window has closed or if you can still submit. And I would just submit anyway, right? 
um, request for information soliciting written comments from the public regarding the administration of school discipline in schools serving students in pre-K through 12. OCR and the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice are committed to ensuring that all students are able to learn and thrive in a safe and non-discriminatory environment. Please note that this notation does not have the effect of reinstating this guidance. Now, what I find to be important about that is um, holding um, accountability um, and making sure that they honor their commitment, right? And so anytime I see a department um, regarding K-12 education or pre-K-12 education say that they have a commitment to doing something, I want to make sure that they honor their commitment. So maybe perhaps um, while you're watching, that may be a part of your advocacy, right? Maybe that would be a part of your advocacy. Um, or if you feel like, you know, maybe the time window has closed for me to submit comment, but I would still like to share some information about my LEA, what's happening in my local community school, right? I would do it anyway, okay? Um, I, I say that, you know, whatever that looks like for you, whether that's a letter or email, um, some of you guys need to file Office for Civil Rights Complaints, seriously, um, because you're just not being taken, you know, as a valuable um, source of information or, or credible as a parent um, with regards to your child's situation, okay? Let's go on. All right, so, you know, really wanted to, to, to dive into um, that, what is the expectation, right? What is the expectation for our children? What is the expectation that even we as parents should hold for our children? And so, you know, it, it's um, one of those things where it's very clear that we have to go over this information because it can't just be assumed. It can't just be assumed. I'm also putting another resource in the chat that talks about um, tiers and um, behavioral practices um, based on tiers. And so I don't have time to go over that, but let's look at expectations. I think expectations um, is something that clearly needs to be evaluated and understood and defined, okay? I'm trying to see here, screen sharing. All right, found it. So for those of you that are just tuning in, I am talking about um, zero tolerance practices and policies um, and how you can make an impact in changing the way that um, people are um, looking at discipline in a punitive way. Um, and we need to be looking at ways to develop children in a positive way. Okay. So here you see, and I'm not going to go through every stage of development. Okay. But you can, you can. And so you, you see uh, this guide around developmental milestones, positive parenting tips, right? And it goes from age group to age group, from zero to one, toddlers, one to two, two to three, three to five. Some people say, well, I didn't get a parenting handbook. Well, you know, here's a little a, a start, right? Um, maybe there are some um, things that are happening with your child that you don't understand. Well, you know, let's look at the age and stage of development. What is what is going on, right? And how to respond to that, right? Um, and so the the interesting thing about this, though, is that, yes, it's it's meant for parents, but I think that everyone that works with children should understand this. And we can't assume that college um, always goes into this in depth regarding developmental milestones and um, expectations tied to punishment practices and all of that. We can't assume that. We can't assume that. And even if people do professional developments around this, we can't assume that that's going to um, equate to changes um, in classroom management. Okay. So as you can see, this offers um, just information, right? Um, what, what should you do in certain, you know, to help your child during this time, right? Children are learning, they're developing, their bodies are developing. Some of them are in puberty. Like, hey, you know, the way your child act as that lovely little toddler um, <laughs> may change when they get to certain ages and you'll be like, oh my gosh, where's my child, right? What happened to my child, right? But does that warrant like punitive punishment practices? 
No. All right. So here is another one that I um, also want you to take your time and look at. Again, those of you that are um, heavily concerned around the zero tolerance policies in the school to prison pipeline, here is a good resource to a review. Okay. I want you to be fully equipped when you go in um, to start discussing the practices and the policies. And like I just said, um, looking at that developmental milestones is a good way to, you know, have that discussion. Um, but I don't want you to feel like I, there's there's not other things that can happen, right? And so there's something that um, is coined local logical consequences, right? So what can be used instead is what we're saying, okay? So zero tolerance, we know. Um, the punishment for age and stage, or is it appropriate developmentally? Are they appropriate behaviors for two, six, and 10 year olds, right? Looking at that. Um, is that punishment commensurate with the action? So if a child does something for two minutes and gets suspended for three days, is that in, in their five or six, right? Is that commensurate with the action? Like that are they even going to know in three days what it was to be able to avoid? Do they have the skills after they receive that punishment to come back and, and, and change that behavior, right? Or are they just going to keep piling punishments up, punishments up, punishments up, right? Um, punishment often evokes negative side effects and is not the most effective way to change behavior. So what can we do, right? We can uh, advocate for logical consequences, right? I use these in my home. I am, am, am more concerned with teaching self-control and self-discipline versus just issuing and, and doling out punishments. It's not, I'm going to be stressed out if I'm constantly, um, you know, over um, punitive and it's not going to help transform my child, right? It's not going to help them to stop and really evaluate ways that they can have self-control under similar situations or ways that they can practice self-discipline um, under the same situations, right? Um, and so what um, we need to be really looking at is how we're developing our children as lifelong learners for better outcomes and giving them the skills and the tools to really think about how they can control their own behavior and their own uh, being because they're going to need to know those skills. They're going to need to know how to do that into adulthood. There's not going to be somebody. Uh, well, there will be. It'll be called the police. Okay, so w we don't we don't want them to enter into the hands of law enforcement. We want them to understand what it looks like. And so, developing using logical consequences um, is definitely a manner in which you can do at home and then advocate to be done. Um, wherever your child receives an education. I see a question from um, Maria and it says, would uh, like to highlight the work of Dr. Monique Morris about the sexual assault to prison pipeline of black girls. If you have any information, please drop it in the chat um, and, or, or unless you're asking me to cover that at another date. I'll be doing this every Thursday, y'all. It probably, you know, will be an hour or less. Um, because there's a lot of ground to cover when we're talking about policy law, um, you know, legislation, codes, regulations, right? So anything that you would like to see covered, put it in the comment field and I will be sure to get to that topic. And we can definitely go through that and really break down what is happening and solutions, right? Um, ways to impact policy changes and decision making. So really quickly, um, looking at logical consequences, right? Um, what they are and how to advocate for their use. I'm going to put this um, link in the chat. So we were looking at ways um, to not shame or, or, or exclude children from their education, right? The goal of punishment is to enforce compliance with rules by using external controls or authoritarian discipline. While effective in stopping the misbehavior at the moment, punishment does little to increase student responsibilities. Talking about that um, training, right? That training 
discipline is interesting because discipline comes from another word, a disciple, discipleship, right? Um, and so looking at how to effectively train a child to have those mechanisms of self-control and self-discipline, right? Punishment often leads to a feelings of anger, discouragement, and resentment, and an increase in evasion and deception. So we see that the behaviors become worse. The behaviors become worse. Thank you, Maria, for sharing that. Everyone um, who's interested in that um, information, Maria did share that in the chat. So go ahead and take a look in the comment field and you'll find that information, right? Um, shame is not an effective or humane behavior modification. So we need to be despising the shame um, and training and developing children into uh, what who they should be to reach their fullest potential, right? So um, again, we're looking at the use of logical consequences. The goal of logical consequences is to help children develop internal understanding, self-control, and a desire to follow the rules, right? Um, there are times when I can just look at my son and he does something. And immediately he, he, he'll check himself. Now, he doesn't do this all the time because he's still 10, right? What is my expectation? But he is developing the internal mechanism and understanding to say, you know, I probably shouldn't do that. And we're fostering ways that he can develop it further, okay? Um, and then, you know, to say, you know what, how can I do better for myself, right? I have this conversation with my children all the time. Like, you're a valuable person. Do valuable people go around acting in such manners? Let's just evaluate that. We have these conversations in my house, right? Um, if you're operating in excellence, do does this look excellent to you? Like, let's just imagine um, you're in um, you're a king or a queen in the nobility, right? Would this be noble behavior? Okay, and so those are some of the the reasonable things that you could do to develop and foster internal understanding and self control and a desire of, for children to follow the rules. Why? Because they know that they're valuable and they know that they have the potential to to get to that place where they can, um, you know, really excel and thrive and succeed. And that's something that we should be fostering. So I'm going to share the information about. Logical consequences. Um, this document goes into it more in depth. Okay. Um, you know, logical consequences, punishment versus logical consequences. And it does give a lot of information that you can take directly to your child's school um, in order to, you know, give those helpful hints and what to do next. Okay. Because I don't want anyone to feel like they don't have the tools that are necessary to help advocate for better, right? Uh, obviously, um, this is based in program uh, professional development trainings and other um, things that have already been done. So you know what? It's it's the, the information is existing and you can definitely uh, share that out in your advocacy along with the data to prove your point. There it is right there, responsiveclassroom.org. Now, one more thing and... Well, it's uh, loading, okay? So for some of you, you might be thinking, yeah, that sounds good, Christina, but you don't know my kid, right? Or you don't know my situation, or you don't know, you know, like, I'm not really sure if this is going to work. And it, like having my child imagine, um, you know, if they're a, a part of a nobility and act noble, right? So this, this particular document is called, phew, is it normal, <laughs> right? Is it normal? Because sometimes we can be thinking to ourselves like, wow, did my child, you know, is, is this normal? Is this a part of this um, age and stage of development? And what should I do, right? Like, what should I do? And so here is a good uh, blog um, that addresses like those normal. And it's very uh, comprehensive, right, from the perspective um, that you may need. And so I'm going to share that also in the chat so you can understand ways to foster um, self-discipline, self-control in your child, and also ways to advocate for logical consequences and looking at brain development, ages and stages in development, and all of those things that are going to help you in your advocacy to change um, zero tolerance practices and policies, okay? All right. And again, here is an, this is the resource that I just shared. I'm ahead of myself a little bit. 
here are some winning behavior strategies, right? You see, I X'd out this. Like, anger is not conducive for anything but causing more stress and, and anxiety and anger. I recognize that over time um, and now am able to say, yeah, that's true, right? Uh, before I didn't, I didn't quite uh, understand that, you know, way back when I was like a, a young parent and, you know, I'm just screaming all the time, like, ah, you know, um, now as a parent, you know, of adult children, grandchildren and, um, school age children, I understand why it's not effective and why I'm just going to be spinning my wheels. Right. And why I need to be more so looking at ways to disciple or modify, um, behaviors. And so here's some winning behavior strategies. Um, establishing clear rules and regulations. That's around the, the area of expectations, right? Um, have your child repeat it to you. Like, do they really understand what you're saying? Like, you know, you can't assume that they do because they're nodding and yes, they want to please you, but do they really understand? And then also ask um, anyone working with your child to establish clear rules and regulations um, so that they can understand the expectation, right? Schedule times to have fun and talk. You know, I do this often. Like, you know what? Right now during this two-hour window, I'm not able to have fun and talk with you, but definitely we can do that at 5.30 or 6 o'clock, right? Um, and so, you know, your child understanding even in their educational environment, those designated times to have fun and talk, right? Establishing that understanding um, and making sure that they understand. Ask them to repeat it to you. Ask them to walk you through their school day, right? What does that look like in their eyes so you can have an understanding? And don't just do it once, do it every year, okay? Do it every year um, and oftentimes during the year. And what I mean by every year is every grade level, okay? Understanding what's age appropriate behavior. We went through that and I shared some resources um, so that you can understand what is age and stage appropriate, right? Looking at those milestones, looking at the way the, the um, brain develops. The frontal lobe doesn't even um, close into like around 25 for some people, right? Like, are they actually, you know, reasoning in the way that we think? Maybe not, maybe not. Um, and some of you may even remember, like the lights didn't totally click on for your uh, entire life until you hit like your late 20s and then you got it, right? Like, oh my gosh, I'm uh, really an adult here, right? Um, and so, you know, looking at the frontal lobe and the brain development and all of those other specific regions of the brain that are responsible for um, data in different um, areas of thinking and reasoning and creativity and all of that. Showing affection and appreciation, I find that to be big, right? Um, because children can get emotionally vanquished when they're harshly punished um, and done over a continual and perpetual time period. And they often start to attribute that to their self-worth and their being. Um, and so, you know, you really have to find a way to um, appropriate that balance and also ask for that to be done in other settings, right? I never leave my children in a space or a place where adults are harsh with them. Like, it's it's just not warranted, right? There's ways that you can show affection and appreciation, and I equally want to teach them to do that back, right? Like, that's a reciprocal kind of thing. Um, you know, you're being praised, and you also need to be appreciative and show that appreciation and gratitude in various ways that are age-appropriate. Promoting self-control, right? Definitely, you know, want to be promoting self-control and self-discipline, making things a teachable moment. If we're in the store and you're touching everything, um, I'm going to have to just stop right then and there. And, and my kids and grandkids know that I will. And I'll get down um, to their level and I say, you know, it, it's probably not a, not a good idea to be doing that right now, right? Like, can you do something else? Like hold on to the basket, right? Um, or hold on to me because I don't, we're in the aisle with all the pickles and the jars can fall and break and it's just not a good idea. Um, and so then also using other things that they see around them happening as a teachable moment, maybe it didn't happen to them, but you can say, see, you know, that's a slippery floor and someone walked on it and you know what, look at, they fell. That's a natural consequence. I don't want you to fall or using natural consequences as a teachable moment, right? I asked you to stop jumping off the couch five times and you didn't, now you hit your head. I'm sorry that you did that, but this was the reason why I told you not to do that, okay? So those are all examples, um, you know, for you. Action, we're almost done here, y'all. Um, action items, you know, I want you to take the opportunity to research, inquire, know, and resolve to advocate. Advocacy doesn't just happen, um, you know, 
because we have the thought about it, okay? Even though in different ways, we're advocating every day, not going to take the time to go into um, advocacy versus activism, right? Being activism, being a part of campaigns, rallies, initiatives, advocacy being more of a natural thing that we do for ourselves and our families. Um, but in order to uh, impact decision-making processes and policy uh, changes, right? You need to research, inquire, no data-based conversations, right? Um, and resolve to advocate for better. So that requires, I'm not going to sit here and say it's easy. That requires you to be unrelenting, consistent um, in your pursuits, okay? Next steps, knowing your state and local rules and policies on school discipline. I sent, I put a whole bunch of information in the chat. That might even have, um, all of it has some kind of link or information to another study or some more data. Utilize that for your data to make um, those changes. Join in coalition with other like-minded parents. See down here, you need help? Reach out to your local National Parents Union delegate, okay? Um, you can either, you know, message us on any of our pages or info at mpunion.org. Reach out for help. Be in coalition with other like-minded individuals and parents so you don't have to go at this alone, right? Um, present best practices and advocate for better. So that's what the next steps are. And um, as we end, I want to acknowledge that it is Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, and I really appreciated um, this one quote that I saw. And it said, knowing yourself is to be rooted in being instead of lost in your mind. Okay. Um, I, I can totally relate to that. Eckhart told it because, you know, oftentimes, you know, I was driving myself crazy, even trying to just please other people into in, a narrative that they saw me as. And then when I finally in my life decided, I know myself and I'm just going to be my authentic self, either you're going to accept it or reject it. Um, I had more clarity of thought and peace. Um, and so I just wanted to share that with you for mental health awareness. We care here at MPU about your mental health. Your mind matters. Um, and so, you know, be paying attention to things and resources that are offered and utilize them, right? Don't just wince and glance over it and say, you know, that looks like a good resource and I'll get to it later. No, what I find is procrastination actually leads to more procrastination. And so now is the moment. If you see a good resource, if you think about something you could do, set your clock and do it or just go ahead and do it now, right? Reach out to that delegate. If you're thinking, yeah, you know what? I need help. Reach out to that delegate. Okay. So I wanted to just give the opportunity to thank you all for watching Know Your Rights Thursday. Like I said, um, in the future, we'll probably be doing anywhere between um, 30 to 45 minutes to an hour. But there are other opportunities for you to um, have resources and information, right? Um, especially um, with regards to politics, policy, law, re regulations, compliance, all, what does it mean, right? You can join us monthly um, for our MPU policy hour. Look on our page for that information. It'll be coming out, right? We have an Ask a Lawyer session the second hour. Um, you can also look at the other resources that we share on our website um, for, you know, toolkits and all of those things that you might need that you didn't weren't aware was there, right? Look at the polling information. Have that data too, you know. Um, so people say when people say, "Hey, we don't know what parents want." Well, yeah, I got some polling data for you. I got some information. We do know what parents want, and so here is um, a resource and a guide to help you understand what parents are saying. Um, other than that, remember that you and your children matter. And I hope that you all do well. I hope that you all thrive. And I hope that you have a good day. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.